Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Although today we live with a cold war, with small brush fires of hot war constantly scattered about the world, we sometimes forget how it was when we lived with an all-out hot war. But it was only 10 years ago, about this time of the year, when we were fighting all over the world the hottest war history has ever seen. Today we are on the alert everywhere to try to prevent this ever happening again. Lest we forget what it was like in total war, we are going to contrast today and yesterday on the battlefields of Europe. The wind, the sea, and the sand have fickle memories. The ocean and its restless borders do not long honor the footprints of men, however firmly they are planted in history. But there are those who remember a different scene on this beach 10 years ago. I remember Omaha Beach. Early one Tuesday morning, June 6, 1944. Omaha was the worst beach. The coast of France, halfway between Cherbourg and Le Havre. We came in with 700 ships, 2,000 planes, 300,000 men. Easy Green, they called this place. Easy? My outfit, the 116th Infantry, lost 800 men here that morning. Green? You bet. Ever try to fight when you've been seasick all night? We landed in the roughest seas the English Channel had seen in 20 years. Down the road a piece, we got help from the paratroopers. Confused the Germans some. The 101st Airborne Division scattered 7,000 men over a 25-mile stretch. They had it rough. They came in first. Four hours before we did. These guys were really the first wave in the Normandy invasion. The main thing I remember about Omaha Beach was being lost. Everybody got lost in that weather. But you couldn't stay lost long. The Germans saw to that. Looking at Omaha Beach today, it's hard to believe it. It's a mighty funny feeling going back in peacetime and standing on a certain sand dune where if you'd stuck your head up 10 years ago, you wouldn't be here now. 10 years ago, Normandy's fresh sea air was kind of cluttered with flying objects. Saint Laurent, I won't forget that place. I wish I'd found a cow around that day to precede me through the minefield. General Eisenhower also came back once after the war. He probably had some peculiar feelings, too, about those who stayed on Omaha Beach. I know how I felt losing half of my squad at Saint Laurent. Another place nearby was Pointe du Ho. A bunch of rangers had to climb up these cliffs under fire. The Germans dropped grenades straight down into their faces, but the rangers made it. The Germans had heavy fortifications around the Normandy town of Isigny. Three days after D-Day, we were taking these things out of action. These seacoast towns all had their little canals and we had to wade them under fire. One of these boats would have come in handy then. On the happier side, one of these wine tankers would fill 50 canteens. Utah Beach had it easier than Omaha. Utah was actually a big mistake. The strong tide carried us 2,000 yards from where we were supposed to land. There wasn't a German in sight. See the bullet holes in that GI can? I can't just say we strolled ashore, but Utah was much easier than we expected. For a while, that is. Then the Germans discovered where we were, and our trip inland was very unpleasant. This memorial sits on top of a German bunker we captured that first morning. By the end of that day, we had 20,000 men on Utah Beach. 
This area was mighty busy then. We landed 1,700 vehicles here that first day. Today, Normandy fishermen mend their nets in silence. But I can still remember the woof, woof, boom of German 88s. The history books say that Utah Beach was taken with ease. Only 118 casualties compared with 5,000 at Omaha. But I picked up a chunk of shrapnel at Utah, and it wasn't easy. Good flying weather helped Utah. 4,000 foot ceiling. 2,000 planes sliced at the Germans behind the hedgerows. A hedgerow is a kind of boundary fence between farms, a mound of earth and a tangle of trees and bushes. Hard to cut through, perfect ambush country for the enemy. We had to fight through hedgerows all the way to Cherbourg, 9th Division, 1st Army. Cherbourg was the first big city we tackled. Three weeks after D-Day. We surrounded the city first and asked them politely to surrender. But they wouldn't surrender, so we had to do it the hard way. Cherbourg gave us the first deep water port for the main drive on into Europe. Cherbourg, an ancient Roman port with a 30-foot deep channel to the sea, has now returned to its proper business of importing butter and eggs to England. For a long, sad time, we produced butter and eggs for Germany. The occupation was most difficult. Some of us died just like soldiers. But it is with thanks to the American soldiers that our city smiles in peace today. saint Lô, another thankful Normandy town with a population of 15,000, has returned to its art of weaving. Maybe I better tell you about saint Lô. This was the breakthrough town. Here's where we started running wild across France. July 19th, 1944, 43 days after the beaches. First with saint Lo was the hedgerow fighting. It took time. It worked hours for a little stretch of plowed field or to get across a road. Inside the town, I remember deciding to use one of the church steeples for an observation post. The Germans shot the steeple off just when I'd made up my mind. Saint-Lô was soon only a shell of a town. The whole Normandy campaign centered in this countryside so we could get going toward Germany. Lieutenant General George S. Patton's 3rd Army started it, used their own blitzkrieg on them and hurtled toward the German border. Battlefields overlap in Europe's long history of warfare. Here at Voisin Cemetery lie American dead from Chateau Thierry and Soissons in World War I. I've heard my dad talk about the trench warfare in World War I. I never saw any trenches. Not ten years ago here in Aachen. There were shell holes in the streets, sure, but we never had time to dig trenches. There weren't any hot dog stands around in those days, just C rations, K rations. Every building was torn to pieces. Aachen was the first large German city to surrender. We took Aachen on October 21, 1944. Then, unfortunately, the weather got real bad and we bogged down in the mud. The way I remember these fields, the cows were lying around with their legs sticking up. We found C rations tasted better than these Aachen turnips. This was Siegfried Line country, dragon's teeth. They're planting turnips again now where we planted Germans. This was the German West Wall. They held us here for three months. It was along here that we found we weren't exactly liberating anybody. Here, the people were German. The Germans remember Aachen too. A war is sad for both sides. Metz. Now there was hard fighting ahead for the industrial heart of Germany. Metz took time, even after we took the city. Several nearby forts held out. Took us from Thanksgiving almost till Christmas. I didn't know till later that we'd taken one of the strongest fort towns in Europe. I didn't know till later that Metz on the Moselle was a very historic city boasting 14 bridges, 10 city gates, and a 13th century cathedral. I was too busy trying to knock them down all the time. 
I've also since learned that Metz has been a battlefield dozens of times in the last few hundred years. It's gotten kind of used to rebuilding. Ten years ago, these railroad yards were pulverized. British and American planes established a milk run. One raid on November 17, 1944 had 2,350 bombers. Aachen, we first had to take. Then we found we had to hold it. This was a new experience for us. We'd gotten used to moving right on through these towns. But Aachen had a surprise for us, the Battle of the Bulge, a Christmas present from German General von Rundstedt. His sudden counterattack cut a 60-mile gap in our lines. Malmody today is a quiet little country village, 7,000 population, mostly German. The townspeople here had nothing to do with the Malmody massacre. That was settled by the war crimes trials later. But Malmody will remain, through the years, a memorial to one of the worst atrocities ever perpetrated against American soldiers. Visitors, straying off the usual tourist routes, find here a unique monument to these dead. It was erected by the Belgian people. Each little bronze plate bears an American soldier's name. There are 84 nameplates here. To the memory of the soldiers of the United States Army, who, while prisoners of war, were massacred by Nazi troops on this spot on 17 December 1944. At the American military cemetery at Luxembourg, not far away as a tank travels, there is an even simpler memorial among the thousand crosses. This is the grave of General George S. Patton, Jr., whose speeding tankers blasted out the path to victory in Europe. Fast known. I tried to look it up when I got back, but you can't find it in the encyclopedia. This is where I spent Christmas Day in 1944. You might remember it on account of one word. General McAuliffe and his 101st Airborne outfit got surrounded in Bastogne. The Germans called on him to surrender. His reply will live a long time. Bastogne has built a huge 48 states memorial to its liberation. The only military activity in Bastogne now is the changing of the Belgian Guard. The town of Bastogne has gone real nuts. You see the word everywhere. The 101st Airborne held Bastogne for five days, although we were completely surrounded and under constant attack by Germans who outnumbered us five to one. Bastogne looks a lot brighter today. During the bulge, there was a heavy fog most of the time and snow. I'll never forget the snow. The bulge started on a Saturday night right after a blizzard. For a week, the Air Force couldn't even get through that weather. We were hungry and cold and scared. We couldn't move for the ice, but there wasn't anywhere to go anyhow. We were cut off in every direction. You might say it was a very skittish situation. Outside Bastogne in the freezing woods, we never knew whether the fellow behind the next tree was an American or a German. Many Germans had put on American uniforms for this fight. I don't know how Guadalcanal or Okinawa was, but after the cold of Bastogne, I'd rather fight my next war in the Pacific. Every vehicle that we could thaw out, we turned into a kind of rescue unit. Small groups were constantly getting surrounded until a rescue team could fight through to them. I spent two days shivering and shooting in these woods till a tank rescued us. It wasn't until the day after Christmas, 10 days after the bulge began, that the 4th Armored Division got through and rescued the town of Bastogne. Then it was suddenly all over, almost. Germans started surrendering all around. The end was in sight. The end was in sight. Here's how I felt about it. Cold, wet, tired of lugging boats. What's a soldier got to do with boats? I learned in the middle of the Ruhr River, in the middle of winter. The Germans had blown up all the bridges. We had orders to cross by boat, and that's what we did. At least some of us did.
You don't feel much like a victorious army when you're about to take a swim in ice water. The current was running like a wild bulldozer. The freezing wind frosted your eyelashes. And all you could do was just sit there and wait for it to happen. Let's examine this situation. The temperature is about 30 degrees. You're soaked to the blue skin, wet long johns, wet socks, wet shoes. And what's more, you're going to stay wet all that day and all that night. You can't stop to warm up and dry out because the Germans will then throw in artillery fire. On the Rhine River, the city of Cologne has quickly rebuilt itself. There's a carnival there now. The civilian population undoubtedly prefers the sound of the merry-go-round to the rising drone of bombers coming over. Cologne was bombed for years. Early in the war, on May 30th, 1942, 2,000 planes bombed Cologne for 90 minutes solid. This one single raid destroyed 5,000 acres in the middle of the city of Cologne. These were wild nights in the skies over the Rhine. It was the 4th of July all the time. Night after night. Day after day, Allied planes headed for the German industrial cities, vapor trails flying. This made things a lot easier when we got there on the ground. Talk about precision bombing. These flyboys destroyed the city of Cologne, leaving the 12th century cathedral sticking up like a scarecrow in the middle of town. The cities of the Rhine. Eisenhower had six big armies ready to pounce. We were moving fast again now. Cologne didn't take long. It took only one day and a night to break into the city and clear out the panicking Germans. The regular German army was beginning to leave the fighting to the civilian Volkstor. Mostly kids and old people, but they were dangerous snipers. All around us, in all the other river towns now, the Germans were pulling back across the Rhine. But it seemed that everywhere I went, the Germans somehow just hadn't left yet. The brass called it mopping up, but sometimes you couldn't tell who was supposed to be mopping up who. Then, all of a sudden, the Germans became hard to find. We had to hunt them out like individual rabbits. This was the beginning of the victory march. There was something in the air in those days. We'd heard about a bridge left standing on the Rhine, and whole units of Germans began surrendering without a fight. The Remagen Bridge had collapsed by the time we got there. It had held up under German shell fire for 10 days, enough time for five divisions to cross over, but not us. We were ordered to stay here and clean up the mess, back into the ice water again. I'm not complaining. I understand the boys who did get across the river complained about the heat. The Germans made the other bank pretty hot, but I stayed frozen and wet for weeks on the Rhine River while the war left me far behind. What's left of the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen isn't much to see today. Just the pilings. Most people remember this bridge because we captured it 10 minutes before the Germans could blow it up. I remember it because they finally did blow it up. 10 minutes before I could get across that river with dry feet. There are those who enjoy camping along the Rhine today. I wouldn't, I've had it. The last time I saw Dortmund, 2,000 heavy bombers had just dropped 6,000 tons of high explosive into this factory district. There wasn't a smokestack standing. Rolling mills and heavy machinery scattered all over the lot. Bomb craters everywhere. They should have no trouble digging iron around here for some time to come. Essen got it just as bad. Shuttle bombing. This was the home of the Krupp Steelworks. And when we were hitting these big steel plants, we knew we were really hitting Germany. Now these steel mills are all back in business again.
Dusseldorf, on the right bank of the Rhine, it was on the wrong bank 10 years ago, it's a town of many little bridges. All these bridges were down the last time I saw it, and you had to wade through the town. Pretty scene today, but you can see how a boat in that river was a sitting duck for guns over on the bank. Although Dusseldorf looks like a healthy resort town, the air is actually about as dusty as it was during the bombing. Smoke from the chemical factories. Industrial Germany has made an amazing comeback. This memorial in Dusseldorf says, return our prisoners of war. Many Germans captured by the Russians never came back. This swimming pool about 100 yards from the Rhine River is another example of post-war construction. In many German cities today, it's hard to tell they ever had a war. Dusseldorf has money today. They're breeding racehorses where the fire bombs once rained down. Where they used to manufacture high explosives and fuel for the Nazi buzz bombs, now they're giving Paris a run for the fashion purse. Ten years ago, how us bulls would have liked this china shop. Dusseldorf, in the center of the thriving Ruhr Valley, is an exhibition town today. But I remember when they were exhibiting something far less pleasant. Some Germans, in the last days of the war, exhibited an unpleasant tendency to shoot when they were supposed to be surrendering. And there's nothing so discouraging as the prospect of getting yourself killed off in the last days of a war. It just ain't fair. The injustice of this we had to impress strongly upon the remains of the Wehrmacht. Toward the end of a war, you suddenly begin to realize how dog-tired you are. Before, for months, you really haven't had time to think about it. Then, as you march through the rubble of your last defeated city, you're suddenly civilian tired, fed up, ain't gonna study war no more. My last city was Nuremberg, 42nd Division, 7th Army, April 20th, 1945. I understand this place was famous for the manufacture of toys. In my time, it was famous for the manufacture of a very fine brick dust. That's about all that was left of Nuremberg. There wasn't much infantry fighting here. The Germans were licked and knew it. And as we moved down these crazy streets, we couldn't help but remember that this was Hitler's town. This was where Hitler used to stage his mammoth rallies, probably the greatest show any one man ever staged. This was back in 1937. Hitler was going great guns then, stirring up the German people to fever pitch. The wonderful new German Reich, designed to last for a thousand years. Well, we saw how long it lasted, from start to finish. Nuremberg was also where Hitler established his infamous Nuremberg Laws that sent millions to concentration camps, starvation, gas chambers, and death. I was very pleased to participate in the Battle of Nuremberg. How Nuremberg ever rebuilt after this, I can't imagine. What the Air Force had left, our artillery and tanks finished. Sometimes you wonder if it's worth all the trouble it takes to capture a city. By the time you've got it captured, it isn't a city anymore. Hitler's famous rallying place, the biggest stadium in the world now only echoed to the ghosts of goose-stepping Nazis and Hitler's raving speeches. Other Hitler ghosts were now being hunted down like the murderers they were. Soon the war crimes trials would take care of the Hitler gang. These evil men who caused that war should have been sent on a world tour to personally beg forgiveness of every mother and father, wife and son. Nuremberg rebuilt quickly. Its thriving industry and bustling people rival any city in Europe today. It is hard to believe that these streets, once reduced to rubble, could in only 10 short years erase every scar of war. A monument to the ability of the German people. These people, once our deadly enemies, have now arisen from the shame of Hitler to stand beside us against the Russian plan for world conquest. The stadium that once saw swastikas flying 
now sees polka dancing with a touch of American jazz. Nuremberg today, arisen from the ashes of war, is typical of Germany and most of Europe. The marks of war now remain primarily in the minds of we who live them. The turn of years is rapidly losing World War II in the misty past. Before our personal memories of suffering are also lost, we who live World War II must spare no effort in preventing a recurrence of this so future generations may play on our past battlefield. Ten years ago, we cannot know what the next ten years will bring. We can hope that these small scattered brush fires of hot war will burn themselves out and that the Cold War will slowly melt into international understanding and peace. We prepare to prevent what was happening ten years ago. Our military preparedness is designed to keep beaches clean, cities unafraid, fields unsown with steel. We pray that Americans never again need visit these places in fury. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at the big picture, the United States Army in action. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.